Hello and welcome. India faces a Hobson's choice. As it emerges from the lockdown in the second half of May, the question is, does it save lives or does it save livelihoods? Because the number of COVID-19 positive cases are continuing to rise. On the other hand, as we all know, the economy remains in deep trouble and is most likely going to get worse. So people have to get back to work. Now the question is, how do they get back to work in a manner that does not place even greater pressure on the public health system? Secondly, there will be a cascade of cases that have been, in a manner of speaking, held up over these months and which will hit the public health system and likely create even more pressure. The question is perhaps best posed to an epidemiologist, and I'm joined by Professor Madhukar uh, Pai, Canada Research Chair in Epidemiology and Global Health, and the Director of the McGill International TB Center, uh, based out of Montreal in Canada. Professor Pai did his medical training and community medicine residency in Vellore in India, and also did his PhD in epidemiology from the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, Professor Pai, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Gopal. So, uh, so first question, uh, you know, it is an Hobson's choice. I mean, we have to emerge from this lockdown because, among other things, we've been in it for too long. And secondly, uh, we know that we are going to be faced with some very, very difficult conditions and situations as we do, given the fact that the number of uh, COVID-19 cases are rising even as we speak. Um, as you rightly said, it's, uh, it is an incredibly tough choice, not just for India. Every country pretty much is struggling with it. Take America, for example. Um, they are um, easing restrictions even as their cases continue to climb day after day after day. Same thing in uh, my province in Canada and Quebec. Our cases continue to rise every day, and yet the province is planning to lift restrictions. There is no question that when your cases are rising, and you um, remove restrictions such as physical distancing, everybody is worried about a surge in cases again. So we may have to go through multiple of these, you know, uh, peaks and troughs uh, before anything can really happen because there is no vaccine on site uh, in, the, in the immediate future. Definitely not for this year. So what do we then do? And with countries like India, I fully agree with you, the lockdown has been brutal, especially for the millions of people uh, who live below the poverty line. And if they don't eat that day, they don't, they don't work that day, they don't eat that day. So I completely understand the importance of lifting restrictions. So the question is, WHO has listed like six criteria that countries have to have in place before they can ease restrictions. Um, I'm not sure India meets those criteria. India definitely does not meet many of the criteria, and yet India is going ahead. The same would apply for the U.S., for example, for that matter. For example, you need a lot of testing capacity to be able to keep track of the virus. So they, they talk about the, the package of test, trace, and isolate. That requires incredible capacity for a country of 1.3 billion people, and India's testing rates are very low right now. So which means we simply don't know how widespread this epidemic is. We don't have sero serological surveys to know what proportions of, of Indians are already infected. I think what will work in India's favor, and I hope this is true, is that the young population structure will somehow push the disease severity towards milder forms or asymptomatic forms. And I'm hoping that would somehow carry us through but India has to absolutely increase capacity for testing, tracing, and isolating, hand washing, preventing large gatherings like movie theater, stadiums. I think those are all common sense approach that India absolutely can do. And also a differentiated strategy, which I'm happy to see is already happening, that you don't have to lock down a place that is hardly reporting any cases. You focus your efforts more on those pockets where there's a lot of transmission, and find a way to intensely engage in that area. But that implies that you have adequate testing in place. Without adequate testing, you right. can't have a differentiated strategy. And that, to me, is where I think India could do much better than it has done so far. Right. And, and you know, one of the concerns that you've also been expressing is uh, that what happens when we come out of it to, uh, to not just the people who are testing COVID positive, but for those who are suffering from so many other ailments, uh, and uh, including, let's say, ailments which maybe require urgent intervention like surgeries and so on? Um, this worries me so much because I work on a disease called tuberculosis. And I know for a fact 
that India, a lot of people in India have simply not shown up on the TB notification registers in the last two months, just because they simply have not left their homes. They've not not being able to seek care, or even if they seek care, there's nobody there to look after them. Private establishments are closed. GPs have gone. There's no testing in place. So if this is happening to TB. I can't imagine it not happening to other diseases. So I'm sure, and I'm calling this the big surge, when the lockdowns ease this month, I predict a massive surge in the number of people who are going to be seeking for all sorts of ailments that they have been just holding on and holding on and holding on. For example, diabetes could be now severe diabetes. Hypertension could now be uncontrolled hypertension. Mental health problems might have worsened. Uh, people may have had mild, mild heart attacks they've ignored. So you want to have a flood of people seeking care. I know, for example, one of my own uh, friends has had to delay cancer chemotherapy because they just couldn't go out. And if you delay cancer chemotherapy, that can have a bad impact on, on, on a person's outcome. So when this big surge happens, my worry is as follows. So the public system will still be dealing with COVID because COVID has not gone anywhere. As you said, it's continuing to climb every day. And India will soon, in about 10 days or so, hit 100,000 cases. So COVID's not gone anywhere. Public system is clearly fully focused on COVID. Private system, a lot of private uh, uh, establishments are shut. I'm not sure if many of them will come back online quickly. Some of them have been seen because of COVID cases. GPs have to come back. And even when they come back, they're not going to be at full capacity in the immediate period. So my worry is between a public system that is fully focused on COVID and a private system that is greatly weakened in its capacity. And even the private system that is uh, available I worry that they may jack up their prices because they've lost revenues for the last 60 days or so, and they need to kind of catch up. And then when the disease spectrum shifts to the right of more severe TB, more severe diabetes, more severe cancer, you need a lot more tertiary care at that point. And tertiary care in the private sector, even without COVID, is a very expensive proposition. So all of this, I worry, will hit the poorest people the hardest. I think the middle, upper middle class and the rich will find a way eventually, right? But it's the poorest segment, which would have more advanced disease, that would probably struggle the most. And unless there is a plan for them, I fear all cause mortality of all conditions in India will go up. In fact, TB mortality is predicted to climb um, very high in the coming months. Malaria mortality and is supposed to double, actually, in many settings. So, uh, could you put some numbers to that, uh, uh, Professor Pai? I mean, in terms of how how much, uh, I mean, for instance, in TB, uh, you know, how many patients do you think are there at this point of time who could maybe not have been now seen for about two months? So, if you look at India, India reports somewhere around 2.7 million TB patients every year. But in the last two months, that number, the monthly notification, has dropped by about 80%. That's a massive drop in notifications. And this is seen in both private and in public systems. Regardless of the system, case numbers have dropped. That doesn't mean TB has disappeared. It just means that people have not sought care. And, and, and if you don't seek care for TB, it will kind of uh, become worse and worse in your lung and push you towards what we call smear positive and advanced cavity disease which means they're highly likely to transmit when they start seeking care. They already would have transmitted the infection within the household because you're cooped up with, uh, with TB and you have to care the people in your home for two months. Intra-household transmission would have gone up. Mathematical modeling studies have now come out showing that TB, malaria, and AIDS, just as examples, mortality is substantially going to worsen because of COVID-related disruptions in the coming months. In fact, TB is predicted to be set back by five to eight years. We are supposed to end TB in India by 2025, according to the Prime yeah. Minister's declaration. That ain't going to happen. There's simply no chance that's ever going to happen. Now we'll be lucky if we can end TB by 2035, because that much more work will need to be done. Same thing for other diseases. I'm particularly frustrated and unhappy that even basic immunization have come to a grinding halt which means we may have children with measles in the coming years. We may have children um, with diphtheria, you know, pertussis, diseases that we had completely come close to getting rid of for a long time. 
And that really is scary because children cannot afford um, to not be vaccinated. In a right. Like and, and I was talking to a pediatrician just uh, uh, the day before uh, from Mumbai, and he was saying that, you know, uh, that uh, he would urge all parents to ensure that children got all primary vaccines without fail uh, at any cost, uh, even uh, while some other booster shots and things like that could wait. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully it's available. That's the problem. It's not that parents are unwilling. In India, anti-vaccine movement is not what we're worried about. We're worried about services not being available close to them in the community, especially in rural areas where if the ASHA worker or the village health nurse doesn't come with the vaccines, parents may not be able to access it. So how, how do you see, I mean, so uh, I know this sounds very grim, but uh, how do we, uh, you know, and, and we've in a way kicked the can down the road and we have to pick it up again now as uh, we go into June. So what is the way out? So the way out is to massively ramp up the ability to test, trace and isolate. You need like a whole army of uh, healthcare workers dedicated to that. If necessary, India should contract with private health sector because private health sector is currently really not doing well. They don't have much to do. So you have to leverage. And I think I, I'm hoping that this, um, this will force India, um, the Indian government, to do a better job of regulating the private health sector. For the longest time, India has just allowed the private health sector to mushroom and dominate and yet not serve the country, so to speak, right? Private health sector in India serves the richest and those who can pay. Now is the chance for the government to say, we are in a crisis, you are uh, an Indian establishment, you have to contribute to the cause, right? Not make them broke, not expect them to do anything for free, but pay them a, a fair uh, wage right. or tariff for any services that they offer. That seems right. like so, a quick way to right. Right. So that the testing will uh, obviously uh, help us find those who are infected and, uh, and, and you know, move forward. But as you said, there is going to be an entire, uh, you, uh, I mean, there's going to be an avalanche uh, which is going to descend on the entire health system. So, how, how, I mean, how do we even begin to counter that? Again, I cannot imagine India having the capacity purely in the public health system. But the, in, India's weakness at the same time, potential strength right now is the private health sector. I mean, 80% of India's uh, outpatient care is private health sector. But somehow, the relationship between public and private has always been one of mistrust. Um, yeah. There has never been a happy situation where the private sector feels like it is welcomed and wanted and treated with respect. And the government somehow always thinks that the government health system is the only way to go. I find this discussion, discussion very polarizing. Uh, in, in my own field of TB, um, I find it frustrating that, you know, huge numbers of TB patients in India are treated in the private health sector, but many of them don't even want to notify the treating TB to the government. The government needs to work harder to win the trust and work with them. Somehow, getting public and private, the all-hands-on-deck approach, is almost critical in this crisis because no one sector can do this. The government's job, I think, would be to regulate to enforce certain policies and norms and, and reimburse the private sector for what is a fair uh, uh, tariff or uh, fee for service. So you're saying that if we were to split the load uh, more smartly uh, between the public and the private, and the private in any case is the, is, uh, controls the major part of uh, health capacity, then uh, we will not face the kind of uh, problem that we might otherwise? So again, in the short run, in a crisis, this is the only realistic way to build healthcare capacity. But in the long run, if you would permit me, um, why did India even end up in this extremely privatized health sector? Because India, no Indian government, not just the current government, no government in the history of India has ever invested in health. India's health expenditure is one among the lowest in the world. I feel. In fact, there are many sub-Saharan African countries would spend more on health in terms of per capita GDP. So India is still skating at around 1.5% of the GDP invested in health, which is simply never ever going to be adequate, especially not in a crisis. But you can't build public health capacity in the middle of a lockdown, right? You cannot build health capacity in the public health system right when a battle is raging. 
in a battle is raging, you want instantaneous reinforcements. And I think the army that you call upon is this large private health sector that can and should contribute in a crisis. The private health sector should also realize that yes, they're not doing anything for free, but in a time of crisis, they have an obligation to contribute. They simply cannot turn away patients. So I'm saying right now in a crisis, we need to bring all hands on deck, public and private. That's the only way to survive this crisis. But in the long run, if India increased investments to say even 2.5% of the GDP, that would be amazing. I mean, people like Amartya Sen, scholars have been wanting and asking for this for decades in India, but no government has ever felt health to be a priority. And after this crisis, if politicians still don't think health is a priority, I don't know what to tell them. I mean, it's like madness, right? This is a great example where if you don't invest in health, your economy is going to get shot in every country. Same thing is happening in America. America is learning, oh my God, we don't have uh, a universal health coverage system. Millions of people are falling through the cracks in this crisis. I think countries that have universal health coverage have in general weathered the storm better than either highly privatized countries or countries which are heavily dependent on medical insurance, which only the, the rich and the privileged can pay. I think that to me is a long-term lesson for India. Investing in health is investing in the economy. And the sooner our politicians understand this, better it is going to be for all of us, I think. And that's how we right. and, 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 and uh, perhaps this is the best uh, uh, opportunity for politicians to realize that. Uh, uh, last question, uh, Professor Pai. You know, uh, you've uh, studied and worked uh, in other countries as well. Uh, how would you relate uh, what we are going through in a smaller way, I'm imagining, with, let's say, the Ebola crisis in West Africa, which even at least for those regions had substantial impact? and therefore caused maybe the same set of problems and then responses? I mean, there, there is simply nothing in, in human history that even comes close to what we are witnessing right now. I think what makes it very different from uh, Ebola, for example, is that Ebola primarily affected poor African countries, and it still does, right? The epidemic in uh, DRC Congo is a, is a good example. It's just that this is one strange epidemic which kind of has hammered the highest income countries the hardest, which is the opposite of what most of us are used to in, in public health. We expect poor countries to perform poorly. We expect poor countries to be, you know, really devastated. And we are finding the world's richest country, the United States, absolutely on the map right now. UK has lost the plot. Italy France, Spain, Germany, you name it, some of the biggest superpowers are absolutely struggling in this crisis. Except for countries like Australia and New Zealand that have done fairly well, most rich countries have struggled. And I worry that because they're struggling so much and taking devastating hits, I also worry what this pandemic will do to how rich countries think about foreign aid, for example. I worry that many of them will cut back foreign aids to poor countries in the future. And I worry that poorer countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, will become more aid dependent because they are also starting to see a lot of cases and their economies cannot withstand it. So I worry about the world becoming more inequitable in the coming decades because the rich countries will con kind of contract into a nationalistic, isolationistic, protectionistic framework and will not be willing to, uh, to consider global solidarity. I mean, what we need now is global solidarity, but I worry that it's all everyone for himself kind of an approach or everyone for herself kind of an approach. Every country has retracted to its protecting itself. And I think I worry what this might mean for the next pandemic if we cannot work together or what will happen if the climate crisis, for example, becomes a massive problem in the coming decades. Again, no one country can solve the climate crisis. Global solidarity is, is really under threat right now. And I would love to see countries more collaborative than competitive and isolationist. Right, uh, Professor Madhukar Pai, thank you very much for speaking with us and uh, hope to come back to you very soon uh, and uh, get your thoughts as the situation develops further. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me.